Welcome back to the Two Months Podcast presented by BioSteel. I'm your host, Joshua Marshall. Uh, this afternoon, I got uh, Phil Stockley with me, Philadelphia. How's it going? Going good. Uh, spring is definitely in the air. I love the uh, I love seeing all the snow melt around here in Edmonton and uh, enjoy the beautiful weather and get outside uh, without the air freezing your face. So yeah, loving the loving the springs it's that springs here and we're uh, getting uh, getting geared up for playoff time here soon. Yeah, it's uh, very exciting uh, in a lot of different ways for sure. And making his two months podcast debut, we teased it last week uh, or a few days ago, I guess. But uh, we have Andrew Ginther, uh, Gibby. How's it going? Good. Super nervous, but uh, hopefully this this will be fun. I think I'm excited to be part of this, and thanks for inviting me in. And yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, no, are you uh, are you pretty excited? I know you said you're coming on. You're a bit nervous, but I think you'll do good. It's been <laughs> a lot of fun for you. Yeah, it should be. I mean, you got a lot of cool guests here like today. Seeing Craig Button, that's pretty crazy. Like I've heard him on tons of different podcasts and the big draft guys. So yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, yeah, that's our guest today. So um, this is our intro right now. So as everyone knows, we're just going to go uh, quick and short. We just want to do an intro. Uh, of welcome to a back to our podcast. And uh, without further ado, we'll uh, throw it to our interview with Craig Button and we'll be back to do a recap later on. Mutz fans, our next guest is a Stanley Cup champion. He is also the TSN Hockey Insider. Or Sorry, let's do that again. Uh, wait. I had a good and then I lost it there. Perfect. Mutz fans, our next guest is a Stanley Cup champion. And he's a hockey analyst with TSN. And he is the director of scouting for TSN. And he also has a podcast with, Cure- with uh, Steve Coolius, the Cool Buttons podcast. We like to welcome back to the Two Mutz podcast, Craig Button. Craig, how's it going? I am really good. It looks like there's three months on this podcast today. There is. There is. Yes, we uh, <laughs> might have to change the name of it. I don't know. We uh, we actually had some good news, Craig. Uh, we just got picked up by a network um, that's with uh, Ray and Dregs, too. They're, um, the Go- that's a great news. Great yeah. news. Yeah. So we uh, so it happens. You build it and they'll come. Yeah. That's, so, how, that's uh, how it works. Yeah. So me, I, me, there, me and Bosco are much. Andrew's a beauty though. So <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, he's a purebred. Is that what you're saying, Phil? He's a purebred. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh yeah. He's a poodle. <laughs> or is he a poodle? Is he one of those poodles that goes into that dog show in the, uh, the Westminster yeah. dog show? Yeah. <laughs> the puffy hair and the, yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He gets groomed twice a day, like every day. <laughs> he does, I'm not yeah. liking the start so far. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you're the rookie here. I right? didn't get the rookie line. Right, 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 right. So we're not like the Boston Bruins where we don't say rookie. So we're, uh, we're you're getting a rookie lap right now. But uh, um, let me, uh, you know, Josh, I want to say something about yeah. that. I wanted to say something about that. You know, I, I, I was talking years ago. I was talking to Guy Lapointe. And Guy Lapointe, uh, obviously a Hall of Famer with those great Montreal Canadiens teams. And we got talking about rookies. And he said, Back in, in when he broke in with the Montreal Canadiens, Jean Beliveau was the captain. And he said, so after a, a stretch, he, the, the, the team went out to discuss matters, shall we say. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jean turned to uh, Guy and he said, what do you think? He says, oh, I'm just a rookie. And Jean said to him, he goes, you're a member of our team. And we need everybody on our team to play to their very best abilities. Your voice matters. You know, you're sitting here, you're observing, just because you're, you're in your first year in the NHL doesn't mean you don't matter to us. Doesn't mean that we're not expecting you to, to help us. And so when we're talking about things, you need to have your voice. You, we need to hear your voice. You're just as, you're a part of the team and your voice matters. Mm-hmm. And Guy said, John said, he goes, you know what, that, that our team is, we're, we're teammates. We're not like the veteran and, and this guy. We all know where we sit in terms of our experience. He said, but we're all part of a team. He said he was in all his years. He goes, he never forgot that. He said, he goes, we never, you know, we knew who the first year players were. We'd have some fun and everything. He goes, but everybody was part of that team and everybody had to do their best on the ice and everybody had a voice off the ice. Yeah. No, it's very well said. It's uh, because when you hear Bergeron talk about, he kind of echoes those statements. Right. And that's kind of the way they've done it. And obviously chair was doing that before there too, with the leadership. So it's, uh, it's interesting to see. It's also nice when they win something or they get something, everyone's involved you know like there's the odd time like you do see something in their stall and some of the rookies are like wow like i'm, I'm getting a part of this too i think gianni giovanni smith kind of talked about something like that or 
um, one of the Smith, uh, Smith brother kids that was there, uh, had talked about something. He was just kind of just blown away of like how the, Craig Smith, Craig. So yeah, sorry, Craig. So sorry. Yeah. So just, um, great to, great to see. Um, what's not great to see though, Craig, uh, transition to the Winnipeg jets and what's going on there. Uh, a rough game last night. I believe that's twice they've lost to the San Jose sharks in the last little bit here. And, um, we have a good friend on the Sharks t- on the Sharks team. We just kind of talking to him last night. It just was just kind of a little bit shocking to see. But what do you think what's going on in Winnipeg? And do we kind of look back and say, you know what? Maybe they really missed Dustin Bufflin, and the demise really started right there. Like, where, where are you at with the, with the Jets? Well, you know, the, uh, let, let me just go back to last year. And so, you know, we saw a team that wasn't happy about the results, and you know. Oh, you, you saw a coach step down. You saw a, an interim coach come in and he couldn't change uh, anything materially for the team. So Kevin Shoveldale looked at his group and he said, oh, you know what? I believe in this group. I believe in the individuals and brought in a new coach and Rick Bonus came in and Rick Bonus made some, uh, made some uh, significant moves right off, uh, you know, right from the outset, you know, namely saying that Blake, Ka- Blake Wheeler was no longer going to be the captain. Through 54 games, this team was very, very good. In fact, through 54 games, they were the best team in the Western Conference. Correct. The best team. And it wasn't accidental. You know, their team defense was excellent. That They were getting scoring throughout their lineup. You know, we, we, we saw what Josh Morrissey was doing. And so you look at, at a material difference in the way they were coached. And, and that was the Rick Bonus effect. And since that point in time, and, you know, we tend to do this in sports. We look, we see a team and ah, three games, oh, no big deal. They'll find their way. Five games, oh, yeah, no, no, they're just in a little bit of a slump. It gets to eight, nine games, you start to go, oh, maybe there's something bigger here. Well, now it's at 20 games. And let me tell you, they got a huge problem. And let me tell you where their problems are. It's with 55, 26, 81, and to a lesser extent, 27. Those are all their top offensive players. Yeah. All their top offensive players have not given them, they're, they're giving them just about nothing, nothing. And, you know, it starts with Shifley and Wheeler. Like, I mean, I, I don't know if they want to put their pictures on milk cartons in Winnipeg because these two guys in the last 10 games have been missing. They And, and it's not just about the score sheet. I mean, you watched the game last night with Mark Shifley. Like if I was like Mark Shifley, if he had to go back and watch the tape of that game, I don't think that he would be anything less than embarrassed by his effort. I don't know how we how, how we couldn't be embarrassed by it. I mean, because it's effort. Rick Bonus talked about it after the game. He talked about it three games ago. He talked about it after the Carolina game. He keeps talking about it. So Adam Lowry gives everything he's got every single shift. You know, you, you got players that are digging in. And you got your top players that aren't digging in. Yeah. They're, they, they, are, they are playing. So, so now, you know what? They, they, Hellebuck's been their most valuable player. You know, you have a situation where you have a team, you have a team that has capability, but it, it's not about capability. It's not about talent. It's about will. Will will is a skill. And right now, their top players are showing very little will. That's a huge problem. Yeah. And, it, and it's been going on for a long stretch here where that's another yep. problem. And how do you see that getting fixed? Like, because this is not the first time, you know, Rick Bonus, and we all know the great person, the great coach he is. He, he said things in the media and you know what he's probably saying behind those closed doors. What, how many more messages does he have to send through the media for these guys to get it? Or are they just not going to get it? And we're looking at maybe the Calgary flames taking over that playoff spot. Yeah. I, I would never suggest players can't get it. I, I, I think those players have to take a long, hard look at themselves, a long, long, hard look at themselves because if they stand in front of a mirror and, and really look into it hard, they'll see that they're part of the problem and they'll see that they're a big part of the problem. If they don't want to see it, you know what, turn off the lights, go look in the mirror and when, when the lights are out and it's dark at night, you don't see your reflection. That's easy to do. But the, those players are capable and they showed it through 54 games. The interesting thing for me is when you look at last year and the way they finished and they use terms like unacceptable, embarrassing, and, you know, now they come back this year, they play really good for 54, for 54 games. And now, and, and Rick's talked about, it. you're going to be facing, you're going to face adversity, you, you know, but that doesn't mean you, 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 you're not determined. That doesn't mean you don't dig in that, that it doesn't guarantee that you're going to get results, but, but, but you can control your effort. 
And th th those players simply right now are, are not doing it. I mean, Rick Bonus talked about, I think it was after the San Jose game, he, he talked about, he talked about like how we have to push through. I mean, they're a perimeter team now. And Mark Shifley after the game talks about, well, this is the way I play. I play below the goal line. I'm waiting and everything, right? Mark, the way you're playing, it like if you were if you were a first year player, Mark, in the league, they would have sent you down to Manitoba based on the way you're playing. Yeah. You you'd be in Manitoba playing in the American Hockey League. And you know what? So I, I, I last year I thought they had a coaching problem. Right now, I think they have a the, 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 and, and I, I'm, I'm a little bit patient with Ehlers because yeah. he was hurt and, and with Dubois because they were hurt. Those other three guys, got to get it going. They're, they're a big problem. Yeah, yeah, they got to get going for sure. Time is running out. For I them. don't think they're going to do it. I, I, I don't think they're going to do it. I don't think they're going to do it. I, I think the Flames. I think the Flames are going to overtake them. And I wouldn't have said that five days ago. No, no. Um, and just because with our you know, the guys that we've had on our podcast from Calgary, we were kind of, you know, just for foreshadowing that we'd see them in, but you know, it's, it's crazy that uh, they're in the fight right now. The flames, they're only two points out. Um, let's move over to the Edmonton Oilers here. Um, you know, another big game where, you know, all their big gun score, uh, Nugent Hopkins, uh, an amazing night. He's going to get a hundred points. That's going to be the the first time since uh, I think 96 uh, when I think it was Yager, Lemieux and Francis had a uh, hundred point seasons all in one team. Um, but I guess the most important thing there, like obviously it's great to see the success they can score Craig, but we all know that if this is a K LA Kings versus Edmonton Oilers matchup in the playoffs, um, where's your level of concern at with the defense and the goaltending? And do you think they can outscore their issues and get past the LA Kings? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I'm going to put this into in, into a into a two team context. So the the, the LA Kings are, are a good, really good team defensively. They're not a really they're not a really good team offensively. So can the uh, Edmonton Oilers take advantage of their abundant offensive skill, and can the LA Kings take advantage of their abundant defensive abilities to 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 negate the LA Kings? That's the way I see. It. You know, watching the game versus Vegas on uh, Tuesday night, you know, it was a it starts off, it's going back and forth. Edmonton put it into another gear that Vegas couldn't match. They couldn't match. They like they, 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 they were they were left in, in in the tailpipe fumes of the Edmonton Oilers. And you're watching that, and you're watching how they dismantled a really good uh, six player defense. In Vegas, they dismantled it. Yeah, and I think that you know that's what it comes down to. Can, can you look at LA? They're going to play good defense, and and they're quick and they're fast, and they're going to generate opportunities off the rush. But I think that Edmonton Oilers' offense, you know, could could take advantage. Like it, it, it's a great matchup, a really good defensive team versus a a, a really strong offensive team with difference makers. So I, I, I'm not worried. About, I don't think there's any clear favorite in the West, but I'll, I'll, I'll put LA up against anybody. I'll put LA, I'll put Edmonton up against anybody. I'll put Colorado up against anybody. I'll put Minnesota up against anybody. I'll, I'll put Dallas up against anybody and, and Vegas. Yeah, that, that's how wide open I think the West is. After that, uh, you know, th those six teams. I think any one of those six teams could come out of the West to uh, play in the Stanley Cup final. Yeah. Very good. Very good teams for sure. Um, it'll be interesting to see if Calgary gets in with all the one goal games that they've had. Does that transition to, you know, anything before, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll leave it there and we'll Phil will probably dive more into that when he gets to that with flames, but I'm going to pass the puck and Andrew Ginther, uh, it's your time to, uh, your segment with, uh, Craig button here, buddy. Here you go. All right. I'm going to head out to Buffalo. I've been a Sabres fan since the days of Ashik. Uh, from Hashik to Miller, and then basically the last decade has been goaltending purgatory in Buffalo. But it seems like there's a light here with Devin Levi signing. Um, comes in with all these accolades, second all-time in NCAA, set records, the World Juniors, uh, so on and so forth. Um, what do you think for him, I mean, coming in, he's 21, minimal pro experience. Is there any chance next year he's on this team, or is it automatic AHL? Like you as a GM, what would you do with someone at that age? Well, uh, I've watched Devin play since he was playing midget hockey, U16 hockey in uh, Montreal. 
U17, you know, whatever with the like St. Louis Lions. And uh, I mean, he, he, he was terrific there. And then he went to the, to went to junior A and he was terrific there. He, he was terrific uh, at the world junior A challenge. We saw what he did at the world junior tournament. We saw what he did at Northeastern university. You, you know, I, I I'm just going to kind of just make a mention here. To me, the four best goaltenders outside the NHL are Devin Levi, Dustin Wolf, Calgary Flames prospect, Jesper Wallstadt, who's in Iowa, the Minnesota uh, Wild, and Yaroslav Askarov, Nashville's prospect. Those are the four, to me, the four best goaltenders outside the NHL. What I would do with Devin is that, and Devin's never been in a race to get somewhere yesterday. He's always understood that, you know, there, there, there's parts of my game I got to develop. There's things personal, uh, you know, with my, just in, in, in my own, you know, personal body and everything that I got to develop. And he, he's never been in a race to get beyond that. What I would do, I would, and, and, and it might be hard now, only because the Buffalo Sabres now find themselves back in a hunt for the, for the playoffs. You know, Pittsburgh stumbling and you got the Florida Panthers and, you know, so, you know, you might not be able to do it. But if the opportunity arises, I, I would get Devin into a game or two or three, depending if, 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 if that's the right thing. Not, not as an indicator for next year, but as an opportunity for him to learn, to see how fast the game is played at the NHL level, how quick the players are, how quick plays develop, how hard they shoot, how accurate they shoot. So that when he leaves at the end of the year, he comes back with a really clear idea of the intensity and the pace of, of, of the NHL game. And then you can evaluate, is he ready or is he not? Right. And, 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 and I think he, he, he can tell himself that, you know, through, through preseason, he, he'll get opportunities to play in the preseason. Even if he doesn't get that, I think that would be the ideal situation for, for the Buffalo Sabres to just give them that they might not be able to do that, but I guess, to finish the, the question and to answer it, I think he's going to need a, a, at least at least a half a season to three quarters of a season in the American League. Just workload, you know, managing managing the workload, you know, everything that goes with being a professional goaltender and, and being the go-to guy. That's what I think. And, uh, you, you know, but Devin, Devin is, has been a goaltender that is always, let me just tell you this, always risen to the occasion. Mm -hmm. I don't have any doubt. I don't have any doubt he's going to be a number one goalie in the NHL. Yeah. And so then like with the Sabres, like we're coming up on 12 years, if they don't make it this year, which it's looking tough, it's like 12 years of no playoffs. And I feel like it's kind of, they're similar to what Jersey was last year where get solid goaltending and they could be in the conversation by the end of the year. Um, they've got four goalies right now on the current roster. Craig Anderson's 41. And I'm, I'm guessing like, People kind of assume the last two years he'd retire, but he's basically eight, eight, eight days between games at this point. Can't really be your backup. Uh, they got Comrie for another year. I think he's a good backup. And then you got UPL, Ukupeka Lukanen, who is, I don't know, the jury's out on him. So what, if, if Levi does start in the HL, what do you think Kevin Adams should do with the goaltending situation? Does he go out and find another number one, or you just kind of wait till Levi's ready? You know, I, I would say this, and I don't think, I, I, I think, I think Kevin's really sharp. And I think oh, that I the moves he's made in, in Buffalo have been real solid. I think you, you, you look at the team and they, they got some terrific prospects. One of the things you've, uh, and I, I'm going to use the term, I'm not saying you did it on purpose, but you glossed over. The best goaltender in the National Hockey League this year was a Buffalo Sabres player, Linus Olmark. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I would be really careful if I were Kevin Adams. Kevin Adams with UPL, yeah. I'd be really careful. The I'll tell you what, I don't think there's ever a problem having too many goalies. There's a yeah. big problem not having one. <laughs> and you know, I, I think now you know you look at all Mark and you're going, oh geez, you know, did, did 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 we expect too much too soon? You know what? Let's see where UPL. UPL has been a really good goaltender you know, at, at, at different levels, he's shown those glimpses. It, it, it's hard. It's hard to be a good goaltender in the National Hockey League at, at, at a young age. And it just goes with the territory. So I'd be patient with UPL. And Devin, I just talked to you about where I where I find Devin. You know, again, you come in, I think Kevin has to evaluate, you know, 
okay, what do we do? They have a really good team. Those defensemen are, are, are so good. Their forwards are good. I mean, Jack Quinn and Paterka are going to only be that much better next year. We see what Cousins and Tuck and, and, and Thompson are doing. Je Jeff Skinner's back to, at a high level. You know, Peyton Krebs and Joe's to fit in really. That's a good team. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think Kevin's going to have to evaluate can I push it along a little bit here? Now that doesn't mean you don't consider trading one of your uh, one of your young, young goaltenders. It just means that he's going to have to be really, really shrewd in that regard. And I think Kevin is shrewd, but you know, there's no way the specter of Linus Allmark isn't sitting somewhere in the back of their head in Buffalo. There's just no way that it isn't. And 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 at the same time, you have to look at what's going to improve our team. I you know. I went through it in Dallas, our team in 1995, we weren't close. We were a team trying to get better. We had a, we had a terrific young prospect by the name of Jerome McGinley. The opportunity to acquire Joe Noondike came along and, and, and that was about enhancing our team. And, and we had lots of good young players and that was about him coming in to help our team. We knew Jerome would be a really good, do we think he'd score 600 goals? No, I'd be lying to you if I said that. We, we, we knew Jerome was a really good player, but to get Joe Newendike, that's what it, that, that's what we had to do, and that's what we had to consider to help our other group of young players. And I think that's where Kevin will find himself this summer. Uh, I have another one about another kind of prospect, Matt Savoy. So he drafted ninth overall last year, 90 points last year, it's 95 this year, another great year. His thing is he's a January 1st birthday, so I think he misses by hours the ability to play in the AHL next year. Um, uh -huh. What do you do with that? Like, is that narrative of, oh, he's done all he can down there. It's going to hinder his development if he goes back to the WHL next year. Or is it like, what would you do with him? You got a really good coach in James Patrick, a former Sabre. So yeah. I think that that is a, you know, that's a, that, that's number one positive. Number two, you know, he, he, he hasn't played at the World Junior Tournament. And I think that getting that opportunity to go and play at the World Junior Tournament would be something that would be really positive for, for Matt's uh, development. Number three, Matt is a is an offensive player. So unless you're going to put him in an offensive role in Buffalo, and, you know, give him an opportunity to see what he can show and what he can do. But if he's not in an offensive role, I, I don't want him – sitting around not playing in that spot. So I, I would have him back in Winnipeg, you know, with, with a really good coach and a really good situation. And I, and, and, and the world junior will, will present an opportunity for Maddie. And, and, and I think Maddie can, can continue to develop his game, uh, you know, with respect to, you know, growing physically and, and, and maturing and just, you know, being consistent and all those things. I mean, he, he's a really good prospect, but you don't want him stagnating, outside the strengths of his game, you know, if he's not going to get the opportunity to be in that. I've seen too many players end up in spots that, that weren't building their game. Yeah, so you're in the NHL, and you're, but you're not building your game. And if you're not building your game, you're losing your game. And I think that that's a, that, 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 that's a huge, maybe huge is, a, is an exaggeration, but I think that's a significant consideration with young players. Okay, last one I got before I pass it off to Phil. Uh, Mavi Mishkov, I saw you had him ranked fourth in the upcoming draft. Um, he signed, what, to the end of 2026 still out there in Russia? Correct. Uh, then there's the whole rush. Like, is he fourth based on his skill, or is a part of that in there? Like, do you think? No, he's four. I'm, I'm projecting where I think the players will be okay. in three to five years' time. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we do a mock draft, which is more fun. I, I have no idea. Let, let me just tell you this about the draft. You know, I, I always get this when I do a mock draft. I try to go, okay, who would fit here based on the range of player? Who and who can I make a case for? Yeah. Do, do you know that NHL teams, for the most part, at four, five, seven, ten, all the way through, have no idea who they're going to draft? People don't believe that. Yeah. Like, because you don't know what's going to happen in front of you. You yeah. have a group of players you're considering, right? And you're looking, but you don't know who you're drafting until it gets to your point. And the deeper it goes into the first round. And let me tell you, seven is deep. Seven is deep, <laughs> you know, and you can sit there and go, we want this guy, but you don't know. So what, what I would say, so I'm, I'm like, I have fun with the mock draft and everything, but my list is based on who it's, it's projecting potential, who I think will be the best players in the NHL. And, you know, Matt Bay's a really talented player, 
But you know, Fantilli and Leo Carlson are just such big, strong, skilled, top line centermen, in my view, that, you know, and, and, and they've been terrific. And, you know, Matt Bay is, is a player that has high end skill and everything that goes with it. But, you know, big challenge for, for, for any team drafting them is, uh, you know, understanding challenge might be the wrong word, but knowing you're going to have to wait. I said today on a different uh, on a different platform. I think the best. I, I, if I had to predict where the best place for Matt Vay Mitchcock to go, I, I would say Arizona, because the, they're they're planning on being somewhere at, at that point in time when Matt Vay Mitchcock's contract is coming up. And so imagine that you're the you're the uh, Arizona Coyotes, and you can introduce a 23 year old player. 21-year-old player, excuse me, in 2026 on an entry-level contract. That's got some real value. Yeah. And it might just intersect perfectly with their timeline, with their other young players, their arena, and everything that goes with it. Awesome. Phil. So so I'm gonna I'm gonna head to San Jose for you, Craig, for a question. And uh just, you know, Mike Greer was kind of he kind of inherited a bit of a tough situation there in San Jose. How do you think his year has gone so far? Well, I think that the first thing is, is Mike recognized the situation he was going into. So, I mean, this began last year when he traded Brent Burns to the Carolina Hurricanes to try to, you know, you know, try to create a little bit more cap flexibility. Uh, the discussions on Eric Carlson are no accident. You know, he, again, he's trying to create some more cap flexibility. They're a team that is not capable of competing, uh, you know, with their current roster over the next three to f over the next four or five years. It's as simple as that. I, I would use the word and, and it's I, I don't want the, it's messy in, in San Jose because their timeline is long. It's long, you know. And so, you know, what Mike recognizes, OK, what are we going to do? He trades Timo Meyer. And, and I, I think that Mike and I paraphrase, he said, you know, where our timeline is, Timo, you know, d d might not fit into what we're trying to do. You know, you got Logan Couture, you got Thomas Hurdle on, on longer on, on big contracts. You know, th they're not going to be able to make a difference when this team turns a corner. I think Mike recognizes that. I think when he, he made the trade uh, with Timo Meyer, he, he got some young players in there. They're going to draft high. But for the San Jose Sharks, he, you know, it's twofold. What do you do with Eric Carlson? And by extension, what does that mean for players, Thomas Hurdle and, and Logan Couture who have been long time sharks and good players and, you know, working your salary cap and then being in a spot where you're building with youth. And that's, what's messy. And, and Mike knows it. It's not, it's not like he's going in there going, Oh geez, what did I get into? But it, it's going to be a long road. It's going to be a long road for the San Jose sharks. It's as simple as that. They do not have one significant difference maker in the prospect pool they just don't they have a, they, they have some good prospects but not a significant difference maker in the prospect pool and you're not competing at this at the nhl level uh you know for the playoffs let alone stanley cups without difference makers mike knows it yeah. and he's got to work through that process and and i i, I you know he came in they're going to be patient with him as they should be he's bright he, he, he's got a strong understanding of, 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 of what has to happen. And, and he's, he's not going to duck. He's not going to duck the hard stuff. Right. Yeah. I was going to ask you, what, what do you think of the uh, players they did get for Timo Meyer in that trade? Well, I'm a big uh, Shakir Mukamadoulin fan. I, I think Shakir could play in the NHL right now. I think he's a, uh, I think he's at the very, at the very least, the second pair defenseman, he, he, he's big, he can skate, he can shoot the puck, he can make plays offensively. He, he very well may be able to uh, move in, in, into a top pair role. He, he's, he, he's got really good uh, abilities in a lot of different areas. And you don't find defensemen like that. You just don't find a lot of defensemen like Shakir. So I, I, I think that that was a good move. He got some draft picks. You know, Zetterland is, is a player that'll fit, you know, probably deeper down his forward group. You know, you got a hot Uke, who's a good skating defenseman, who's probably a, five, a four or five defenseman if he continues to develop. 
but that's what Mike was trying to do. I mean, Mike was trying to add some, add some players that, you, you, you know, can, can he can build around. And I think he certainly did that with Muka Madulin. You know, Zetterlin fits in nicely. They, they have William Eklund, who's a good player. They have Thomas Bordalo, who's a good player. You know, but those players are going to need help. Eklund on his own isn't, isn't a significant difference maker. He's a good player. He'll be better when he gets when he has strength around him and support around him. So I I think that you consider a lot of different things. It comes down to evaluation. I I can look at it and go well maybe I would have taken that player over that player. But you know mm -hmm. Mike Mike looked at it and said here's what I think can work and here's what I'm comfortable getting. The prize uh, to me was Muka Madulin and I think that's a a really good solid uh, player for his blue line in the future. Awesome. Uh, I know, I know we're running a little short on time, but I do want to touch on the Calgary flames uh, with you, Craig. Uh, uh, some exciting uh, news for flames fans is they uh, did actually uh, ink Matt Coronado the other day, the other day. And there were some questions about that. Uh, uh, I think Elliot Friedman said that uh, Brad went and put the full court press on him. Uh, obviously it worked. So could you uh, maybe just tell flames fans what they're getting in this kid? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, Matt's a Matt, Matt Matt's a very very uh, gifted uh, offensive player. He's a hungry goal scorer. He, he 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 he's got kind of a Brendan Gallagher type approach to the game. You know, he he get he's hard inside the dots. He's hard at the net. He he can score. He, uh, you know, he can spot up and score. He can score from different areas in the offensive zone. He doesn't have to be in and around the net. He's really smart. He knows he knows how to get open and when to get open. So you, you you play Matt with a really good centerman that can get him the puck. He'll score. But 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 Matt is not somebody that uh, allows himself to be denied easily. He he pushes through resistance. He pushes hard, and he he wants to score. He he'll shoot the puck and hunt the puck, and he'll follow a shot and try to find a way to get. If the first shot doesn't go in, he'll try to find a way to get the second shot in. And you know, but you combine that competitive spirit, real good skill, and that scoring ability. And the fact, I mean, he's a right winger in my view, you know, it's an area that the Flames uh, need some help in. And, you know, mm -hmm. certainly, you know, I, I think that Matt needs a year in the minor leagues. I think he needs a year in the American Hockey League before he'll be ready. Maybe maybe it'll be a little bit quicker, but 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 to me, a really good, a really good uh, prospect for the Calgary Flames. Do you see him getting in any games this season? Well, I mean, again, it's kind of the same thing as we were talking about with Devin Levi. You know, I, I would say if the team fell out of a playoff race, you know, I you, you might I would say yes, but it's yeah. pretty difficult when you're in a playoff race and, and and it gets serious and the intensity is high to take a young player to take a young player with no experience and and it's not about asking him to do something; it's asking your coach to put him in. Right. I think that's a <laughs> I think it's an unfair ask, like you know, and you you, you know you got to just say. Hey, listen. This is this is what we're doing, and this is how we're doing it. And bottom line is, is I think that you know Matt has to understand that. I think Devin understands that. And yeah, they'd like a chance to play. I don't think there's any question. But at the same time, tough, tough for the coach, uh, you know. And, and then okay, so Matt Coronado gets in the lineup and he plays three minutes, and somebody's going, Daryl, why are you playing him three minutes? Well, you got to have confidence to play players when the heat's on. Now, if the heat's off and you know, maybe, maybe they clinch a playoff spot and he can play them in a game or two at the end that, you know, but that becomes a lot easier to do than when you're in the, when you're in the intensity of a playoff race. Yeah, absolutely. And you can, and you can put uh, like Dustin Wolf in that same situation too, as, as Devin Levi, like you said, and, and Matt Coronado, like same kind of a thing. Right. Um, so uh, uh, last question, Connor really. Zary too. Let me just finish. Yes. Connor's, yeah. Connor Zary is really taking his game up the level. Jer Jeremy Poirier is going to play in the NHL. Uh, I mean, a really good. I mean, he has rounded out his game. He went into a St. John Sea Dogs lineup as a 16-year-old where they were all 16-year-old defensemen, and they got beat up. They got, you know, you talk about, you know, getting, you, you know, getting cut up and bruised and beaten and everything. That's what happened to, uh, that's what happened to Jeremy and a lot of them. But he, I mean, they won the Memorial Cup last year. He has really played well in Calgary. And, you know, Mitch Love and Joe Sorella and Donnie Knockbauer, they've done a terrific job with the young group of players here in Calgary. So I, I think Zari's going to be a good player. He's really progressed. 
I, 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 Jeremy Poirier, Jan Kuznetsov, to me, he's going to be kind of a, a, a five, a, a bottom pair defenseman, but they got some players that, that become re really valuable for your lineup, you know, down the road, but uh, certainly some players that, you know, give a lot of hope. And uh, I, you heard me say Dust, Dustable is going to be a number one goal in the National Hockey League. Yeah. yeah. There's something that I just want to jump in there real quick, Phil. Sorry. Um, I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot on this one, Craig, because, you know, it's a team effort, but can you talk about what your brother Todd has done? You know, we just saw Michael Backlund play 900 games in the NHL at that draft board. You know, your, your brother was there, um, you know, and it's a team effort, you know, it's the whole scouting staff, but can you talk about how proud you are of your brother Todd for what he's done and, and, you know, developing and finding some great, great players for this organization in the Calgary Flames? Actually, I can't talk about how proud I am of him because I'm not. I like I mean, I have <laughs> <laughs> You know, here's what, like, let's not forget, too, you know, that, that, that they drafted Goudreau and they drafted Matthew Kachuk and everything. Yep. I, you know, I, I think there's two things I would say about Todd. Number one is he's been with the Flames for 26 seasons, 26 years. You know, that's not easy to do. Yeah. Different different management groups and everything. So somewhere along the line, and we, we we see good people get changed out, not because they're not because they're they're not good, but you, you know, new management comes in and they, they they want different voices or they want people that they're more comfortable with. So the fact that he's been there for 26 seasons tells me that uh that different managers have come in and valued him. And I I I think that speaks volumes. Number two is in, and he would be the first one to tell you this. It is a team. He he will tell you that Jim Cummins was was the was the person that pushed for Johnny Goudreau. He 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 will tell you that Rob Sumner was the guy that pushed for Yuso Valamaki. Yuso Valamaki is not with the Flames anymore. That's a big mistake. Yeah. That's a big big mistake. Back to patience. You know he he will tell you that. You know, you, you you look at Michael Backlund and their European scouts and everybody that worked through it. Like, you know, I, I he will tell you how important it is to have people working alongside him that not only are doing the work, but, you know, have confidence in, the, in their own assessments and have courage to, to, to say, hey, this is what we got to do. I, th I know he would tell you that his biggest his biggest uh, contribution is allowing other people to shine and al allowing other people to flourish. It's not about one voice. It really isn't. No. And to allow them to say to, to work and, and give and give direction and, and and development in certain areas and direction in others to to be able to uh, have a really strong scouting system. And I I think that's where it's at. You know, ultimately you're going to be judged on the players you draft and and how well they perform at the NHL level. But uh, that you can go through it and you can look at a lot of the, I mean, it's not just Kachuk, Goudreau in the fourth round, and, and you got back later in the first round, and you, and you certainly have TJ Brody, I talked about Valimaki, Dustin Wolf in the seventh round. I mean, there's a lot of different players, and, 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 and you know what, nobody's perfect, you're going to make mistakes, but I think that the direction and, and, and managing the whole scouting process is what gives him the most sense of pride. And I think that that's why they get results. Yeah. Perfect. Um, Phil, yeah. Phil, just, did you have just another really, one? Phil, Phil no, just one. really, I did really quick, just uh, before I pass it back over to Bosco here to uh, finish us off. Uh, are the Calgary flames going to make the playoffs? Yep. I, 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 five days ago, I would have said, Phil, no. Today, I'm, I'm watching that Winnipeg Jets. On, I, I watched them on Saturday versus the LA Kings. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, they're going to come out of that game thinking that they played pretty well. And you know what? They did okay. They kept their head above water. You know, it's like it's like entering it's like entering a, a, a 400 meter uh, swim race, and you you, you know you, you didn't win a medal, but you didn't drown. All yeah. they did was tread water against the LA Kings. And you know, shout out for Summer McIntosh, just setting setting a world record Canadian swimmer. The 400 freestyle, pretty yeah. impressive. She's she's going to be a big time medalist next year at the Paris Olympics. I say that because my wife works with the Canadian Olympic Committee, so that's a little <laughs> shout out there. Yeah. So 
So I think, and, and sure enough, oh yeah, they thought, no, they, 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 LA could have played that game till four o'clock in the morning and they weren't going to lose. And then you watch how they played last night against uh, on, on Tuesday night versus San Jose. My, my confidence, you know, I, they asked me to do a worry meter last Friday, I think it was on TSN. And I said, ah, no, I'm not, my worry meter on the, uh, on the Winnipeg Jets is a 10. It's a 10. Yeah. So I think the Flames, and I know Daryl too, and I think Daryl's had his own uh, challenges this year, growing pains. I think that he's had some uh, some some uh, some evaluation where he hasn't been at his best. I can guarantee you this: going into Friday, he knows that that's like Game Seven of a Stanley Cup playoff series. Yeah. He's going to have that team so prepared to go in there in Vancouver because he knows he knows that you go into Vancouver, you win. And Detroit goes and beats Winnipeg. You now are tied for the last wild card spot. Daryl, this is where Daryl can shine like very few others. And yeah. so, like, you know what? And, and Rick Bonus is good. I, I think I think the Flames are gonna. I think the Flames are gonna find a way. I really do. Yeah, same here. And I would ask you if the Sabers are gonna make it in, but I don't want to hear your answer. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, no, no. I mean, Tage Thompson's hurt. I think that the, the, the you know, that the, that affects. I, I think what the Ottawa Senators and the Buffalo Sabers have done this season has been fantastic. I think that we're nearing the end of March. They're playing games that matter. Yeah, and it's been a while. What? Yeah, it, well, and it has. And and forget about the previous eleven seasons. That's not on Kevin Adams. I know the fan base is looking at it, and and, and as they do. But it's this team, I think the Buffalo Sabres are positioned to be a serious Stanley Cup contender for like maybe not next year, playoffs next year, and then after that. But after next season, I think they're in a window of, of, of being a serious Stanley Cup contender for five, seven seasons. Like that. <laughs> All right, Craig. Well, uh, we appreciate your time as always and uh, have an amazing week. Have an amazing weekend and uh, looking forward to some WHL playoffs here too. It's going to be fun. Uh, Calgary and Red Deer in the first round here and somewhat of a battle of Alberta too, um, but it'll be fun to see and uh, all the best to you and your family. And uh, thanks for, uh, for joining us this week. Yeah. Yeah. No, my pleasure, Josh. You know that. Thanks uh, for joining Phil and you know what I would say to the rookie, not a rookie anymore. You had it on your belt. It's all good. Like away we go, right? Like, awesome. you know, and like, you know, Josh is, Josh is such a, 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 a wonderful person and everything. So, and I, I know this about Josh, he wants to raise people up. So the fact that you're, you're on here, he just wants to see you do well. So I would say uh, on, the, uh, on the, on the, on the first time appearance meter, you get a 10. Oh, awesome. <laughs> he, he, he's, he, he's already passed me on the prospect uh, ladder there, right? Eh? No, I, no, no. I, I just said first time on the first time podcast. Maybe, yeah, exactly. okay? like, I'm, not, I'm not going to start. I need a lot more. I can't just go watch a player once and then start saying, uh, you know, start making you more assessments on prospects. I, I need more than there one. There you go. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, Thanks, thank you. you guys. You have a great day. Mutz fans, uh, our next guests are uh, a part of the Hello Hockey with TSN 1260. Their show is going to debut this Saturday on TSN 1260 from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. We'd like to first welcome Tom Gazzola. Tom, how's it going? Awesome. Guys, I feel like it's summertime already. Is that weird? Yeah. Yeah, you're looking like a million bucks right now. And Look at this. Look at this. <laughs> exactly. We get the exclusive. Yep. And uh, we have uh, a good friend back with us, too. Uh, we'd like to welcome Sean Bell. Sean Bell, how's it going, buddy? Things are great, man. Thanks for having me back on. No, no, no worries at all. Uh, so how how excited are you guys? First, Belzy, how excited are you to get this going and, and uh, you know, kind of talk about where it all started from? And I know I kind of heard you guys on the pregame and postgame show there um, the other day, and I just kind of was like, man, this is pretty cool. I saw the tease, but uh, for the fans that don't know, what uh, what what is Hello Hockey going to mean uh, for this market in Edmonton here too? Well, it's been about a year and a half. Uh, we started talking about it, proposing it, kind of going back and forth, and finally it's come to fruition. So, uh, you know, for me, I'm not going to speak for Tom. I'm very excited about it. Um, honestly, just can't wait to get started. And, you know, the, the premise of Hello Hockey is – a show about everything hockey. It's going to be a weekly destination for hockey news. We can set, you know, the biggest games of the week or even the weekend if you want. 
Um, we have the ability to take the show to the Spangler Cup, to World Juniors, to pre-game segments or uh, pre-season segments. We we really can take it anywhere, and that's a, that's a beautiful part of the show. Yeah, no, awesome. And uh, for you, Tom, like how excited are you to kind of work with a great person in Sean Bell and just the, the obviously you guys got an amazing staff there and Bells is one of the beauties in the city as, as everyone knows. And I loved how like in that hit that I saw is like this guy is connected with so many people and brings so many people together. Well, how special is it going to be able to, to work with him and, you know, build the relationship you guys have together, but also, you know, bring in some great guests on and having some great content for the fans to listen to too. Yeah. Uh, Josh uh, Belzy. Uh, has uh, run the gamut in hockey, which is amazing. And um, my history with him goes back to Bantam when I <laughs> was playing. Uh, I was I was on the Bantam Double A team, but I got called up basically every like I'm, we maxed out how many games I could play on our Bantam Triple A team. Um, it, we had a shitty. Can I use that term? Oh, on oh yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. we had a really <laughs> bad organization at MLAC, and I remember like the first game I played with the triple a team after surprisingly getting cut, the coach brought me and my buddy aside and he goes, listen, we're going to call you up as many times as we can because we had to keep some guys that we shouldn't have kept. And uh, Belzy was one of the guys I had to play against. And I remember playing against KC and just being like, Oh my God, like how am I competing against this guy? Like I was a scrawny little runt you know, uh, five, nine, five, ten at that time. I barely grew after that, maybe 150 pounds if I was lucky soaking wet. And we got this Adonis of a man that's just running through us. <laughs> yeah. And and he was so good. And I just, and it, le- it left an impact. I'm le- and Dion Phaneuf was another guy that we played against. Mark Fistrick was our on our team at that time. And those were the guys. Like And, and Shannon Zabados on the female side, she was our goalie and Belzy and and mark and dion became nhl players and pro hockey players and and people that uh of the mid 80s in edmonton strive to want to be um and then all these years later him and i we've become friends when he was with oklahoma city and i was covering the team with oilers tv we we struck up a kinship and uh it, it has remained since and when sean came to me with this idea i was like you know what, Belzy, you've done everything in hockey. You really have. And now he's on the coaching side. He manages as well. He's seen it from all angles. And listen, I know Edmonton's a, an Oilers town, and I know Alberta, Northern Alberta specifically, is super Oilers, and Phil can attest to Southern Alberta being big-time flames. But listen, there's a big world of hockey outside of Oilers and Flames, and uh, Belzy and I feel like we can dip into that and kind of uh, bring that to uh, Alberta right now and hopefully beyond. Yeah, it's nice. Um, Belzy, with your connection with minor hockey, how much do you think minor hockey will be talk on uh, Hello Hockey? How much content do you, well, guys, do you go with? <laughs> uh, there's going to be a little bit. Uh, obviously, um, Sound Dice is sponsoring the show, so you know from from that perspective, we have to – talk a little bit about minor hockey and I'm going to try to make it as un- unbiased as possible. But the hard part is, is they're not making it easy for me to make it unbiased. Like yeah, yeah. it's just story after story after story that I'm hearing where it's just like, okay, well you guys are literally making the case for why we exist. So I'm looking forward to actually having those conversations. Once again, I'm going to try to make them unbiased. Um, but there's just so much that parents have to deal with. And, you know, I- I've said it before in other shows and like, if this was me in this day and age, I don't know how much I'd be able to play. There's just too much. And it's also super expensive. And and that's been a problem, I think, for hockey for quite quite some time now. Yeah. And for you, Tom, uh, before I pass it to Phil, he's one, he's going to definitely ask you guys about the Calgary flames before that'll be like the last question before we uh, we, bring it on. Exactly. So, um, but for you, Tom, like, you know, how, how cool is it going to be to get this, this show up and running at the best time of the year, you know, playoffs are just going to be around the corner. The Oilers are looking to be on a long playoff run too. That will obviously bold well for the show and all that too. But just in general, of you guys covering the game and playoffs and all that, how excited are you for that? Uh, you know, and all the po- shows that you do, it's just yep. such great content to cover, right? Yeah, and and it, Josh, basically, it'll take like a, a tiny focus of 
the Oilers picture, which is my my bread and butter, my day to day, yeah. as we've talked about, and it just expands it league wide, uh, hockey worldwide, and part of uh, the sell to TSN and my bosses there was, hey, listen, like we know, like I think we knock it out of the park when it comes to Oilers coverage, and that's Monday to Friday. Actually, I would say all week long we knock it out of the park, but why don't we? broaden our horizons and let's talk about what's going on in the Eastern conference. Let's talk about what's going on in the central division. Let's find out what those storylines are that, and we can dig into them and, and, and kind of uncover some stuff that people here would be kind of blinded to because they're so focused on, you know, Edmonton, Alberta, and then the Western Canadian hockey picture. Let's open it up. Let's open it up and let's bring in guests. Let's tap into Belzy's Rolodex and let's have him, you know, get these people who he's very comfortable with discussing what is really going on with other teams. So, yes, uh, like Belzy said, and like you talked about, Josh, we'll, we'll incorporate the minor hockey element. That's very important to this yeah. show. But we'll also broaden the spectrum to the full National Hockey League because it is a Saturday morning. Mm-hmm. Saturdays are the biggest days in hockey. And then we have the five day lead up. And, you know, so we can chew on what happened for five days. And then we can tee up Saturday, which is always a huge night. So it's kind of in that sweet spot. Uh, and then you add in the other elements of of all that's going on in the hockey world. It, it just really juices it up. And honestly, I don't think there's a show that's like this that we're proposing and going to be doing out there at all. I, I don't. And when you had that tease on your Instagram, when I messaged you, I was like, as soon as you kind of talked about it, I was like, you're right, man. Like I, and I tap into like a lot of these other markets and it's just like, it feels like you want more on weekends. Like, and there's just nothing yeah. there. And it's like, you wake up, you're doing something around the house, cutting the grass or whatever, just throw it on and off you go. And it, it's just, it's amazing to have, especially cause it'll be nice out too. And then the winter time, you know, you could be, you know, cleaning the snow and, and all that stuff. It's just awesome. So <laughs> um, Phil, I'm going to toss it to you. You could ask the, the fellas about your, uh, your no, I was going to say work. like uh, that. Yeah. Like super cool. Like uh, broadening your horizon and getting outside of Alberta. And you know, on that note, the Calgary flames and the Edmonton Oilers, uh, let's just, uh, let's just go there. Um, so we just had Craig button on. He told me the Calgary flames will make the playoffs. Uh, what do you guys think? Go ahead, Balzi. Yeah, I think they're going to limp into the playoffs. Um, hey, like, being very honest, and all joking aside. It, it's I all good. You know what? I, I've really been I've been players. abused all year. So I've been abused all year. <laughs> I can take it. It's all good. Okay, like, the, well. the Calgary Flames have hurt me this year, and they've hurt me enough. So, you know, I'm already damaged goods. You're good. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> they, you know what? Like, they, they've got good players, honestly something is not going right there. I don't know if it's so much that there's certain players fighting against the coaching staff. Cause let's be honest, Sutter, while he's a great coach, he's not for everybody. And a lot of these new age players, like they can't take the beating that he doles out every single day. Um, you know, so there might be a little bit of a power struggle there. Um, so yeah, I, I personally want them to make the playoffs it's always amazing to have two Alberta teams in there. So I'm going to take that, you know, bias out in the sense that I'm a Oilers fan or I'm from Edmonton, but I want to see Edmonton versus Calgary in the playoffs. And I want to see the old steamroll come right back out and bye bye Calgary in the first round via <laughs> sweep. Yes. Does 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 <laughs> let let's just let's just talk about this for a second. Let's say the Flames do limp into that last spot. Let's say the Oilers do jump into that top spot and we meet in the first round. Does that concern you at all? No. 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 Well, I I just think I just think the uh, the Flames are too fractured right now. In, in a perfect world, if they were completely on the same page, everything was going right. 100% it would actually worry me because Sutter teams are notoriously hard to play against. However, this year, it's just not vibing. And that's the reason why I say I'm not worried about it because it almost seems like when things go wrong and it takes one or two goals for things to go wrong, they kind of just self-destruct. So it's not on the same level as what they could be. And so that's why I say that. 
we give the last word to Tom here. We probably gotta let you guys go. We're running late, but your kind of thoughts on the on the Flames, Tom, and and what's going on there. I'm a guy, Phil. I'll tell you, I picked them to win the conference and win the division this year, and uh, I thought that the moves that Brad Trey Living made were actually pretty good, all things considered. With the hand that he was dealt, I looked at that and I'm like, geez, these guys might be better than they were last year, and they were really good. And you know, Markstrom not having the start that he wanted, um, adjusting to the shock of of Goudreau and Kachuk being gone. Uh, to a lesser extent, obviously, good Branson. But I thought that the guys that they brought in and Huberto, Uyghur, and uh, obviously Kadri, I was like, geez, th- those are good players. And it hasn't meshed. And and Belzy kind of hit on that. And, and it was a surprise to me. So I do want to see Calgary make the playoffs. I really feel like it's better for hockey in general. Yeah. Speaking of hello hockey, that the Oilers and Flames are in the postseason at the same time. I think it's better for hockey when the Oilers and Flames face each other. I'll tell you what, covering that series last year, being down in Calgary for the first couple games, when it came back here, it was amazing. I I said this province would implode, and it came pretty damn close. And uh, (laughs) it was a lot of fun. And I I really think, and I know it tugs on everybody's heartstrings in this province, but everyone gets involved. Everyone gets engaged. It's an emotional roller coaster, and it's way better to have that than to have both of these teams or just one of them yeah. in and then the other one on the sideline or both of them on the sidelines. Like that's the beauty of this sport is when the best and the, the rivalries are going toe to toe. So I really do want to see Calgary make the playoffs. I think it's possible. I hope it happens. And if the orders slide into first somehow and Calgary gets in, I would love to see that series versus those two teams. Awesome. Yeah, that's really it's really awesome you said that because it's like even like my dad's never watched a game in his life. And last year he's like, Oh yeah, did you watch the Flames and Oilers like in the playoffs? I'm like, Yeah, dad, I did. Did you? He's like, Yeah, I did. <laughs> so absolutely, you're absolutely right. That's so cool. Well, thanks guys. Yeah, everybody time. everybody just tunes in for that that yeah. uh for those series, right? Like when you get the you know, yeah. the Battle of New York, the Battle of Alberta, like people want to see those. Those are those are historic rivalries and you know for for alberta like we should be really rooting that on and cheering that on and that's yeah. what we want to see so yeah yeah perfect um do you guys want to plug your sponsors for hello hockey if you have them there if not i know i might put you on the spot but there might go be- ahead belzy yeah just silent with ice sports and entertainment um you know we've got uh, silent rides you got the jphl you got the hsl all their member properties um Hey, they're, they're trying to change the game and we love them for it. Yeah. Perfect. Right on. Uh, gentlemen, all the best to you guys. We'll be tuning in and, uh, looking forward to kind of the next, uh, the next road that this brings, uh, great hockey fans and, uh, all the best to you guys here. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks Thank Josh. You Phil. Yeah. Those guys were pretty quick. Eh? Well, Phil, that was a, a pretty loaded episode here. You know, Craig Button and then uh, Sean Bell and Tom Gazzola. What was your kind of takeaways from, uh, you know, these uh, two interviews that we just had? Yeah, really good. Uh, it was really nice. Uh, it, I think Andrew knocked it out of the park, man. How, how do you think Andrew did? He did. He, uh, he quickly exited stage left. Uh, he was, uh, you know, tight for time. He's got some other commitments. So he didn't join us for the eyes that anyone heard for the uh, – for the Gazola and Belzy interview, but, uh, you know, I thought he did good. I, uh, you know what, I had a lot of belief in him and he, uh, he knocked that out of the park and, you know, and, and Craig is honest in his assessment in his scouting report and his scouting report for Ginter was good. I think this mic might be going into Ginter's hand here pretty soon. So uh, he, uh, he might be taking my job here pretty soon, which is not yeah. a good thing. Cause I want to, he'll, he'll be on his, he'll be on his own right yeah, away. Exactly. Eh? It'll be the Andrew Ginter. It'll be the show. Andrew Ginter show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, which actually sounds pretty good. So it's a good ring to it, but uh, yeah, no, I thought he did an amazing job in his first little kick in. And for people that, um, that are just tuning in or new or have been with us for a while, I know we've, had a couple guys here and there and like obviously Trevor Ruptash is still with us and Clay Vanner I'm still with us and Brody McIntyre is still with us um and I know the thought the theme is too much podcast but uh we have spent a lot of resources in that name and having it out there and and all that but uh you know so but everyone kind of knows the key players most of our interviews with our guests are with either myself or with someone else so we do stick to the theme of that you know I know in some episodes we have 
a couple people a little bit more than the actual two months, but, uh, you know, these guys are all friends. They're amazing. Um, kind of, as we said with Craig, like we, uh, we have, uh, kind of a, a good opportunity here to join, um, a good network here in Vancouver. So, um, you know, and they're with, uh, the, the Sakaris and price and the Ray and dregs are with them. So go, go sports is, uh, is an amazing group. Um, you know, looking forward to get going with them here. Um, it's going to be a lot of, a lot of new things that we can able to, we're able to do. Um, we're excited for this opportunity. Um, and we'll have more on that as episodes come up, but, um, it's looking pretty cool and, you know, just appreciate the TSN guys for always kind of helping us out and being good to us. And, you know, same with the sports net guys and, you know, the, some of the ESPN people and whatnot, and, you know, it's going to be a lot of fun and, you know, just adding like Ginter a part of it. I'm going to be taking on a little bit more responsibilities at my day job. So kind of adding Ginter in and whatnot can kind of have me take a little bit of a step back and, you know, Phil's jumped in a lot here and, and that's something he can take on too. So kind of addressing the nation in that way but uh it's pretty cool and i think we got a good thing going on here phil yeah like so so yeah in 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 saying that like i just think you know craig button's just such a great guy and he's so gracious and uh it was just great with great with andrew on his first interview and you know even great with me like because still still new for me too i've only been doing this for a couple of months yeah and uh you know guys like that do they just make it easy and and even like gazola and 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 uh sean just they, they make it super easy uh just just great people all around and that's kind of what you find around the hockey world right just like so, yeah. so many great people they're all gracious with their time and they're willing to to bring you in and have a conversation and so yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun and looking forward to the journey here. Um, I don't know. Is there anything else you want to add before we head out? Get outside and go enjoy the weather. Yeah. It's beautiful today. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. I know they said it might snow here. I hope not, but if it is, it is, we know it's, it's May, snows on May long, but um, we'll get through yeah. it as we always do. And uh, if you're listening to us, you know, give us a five-star review. We would uh, really appreciate that. Um and any of the platforms that you guys are listening to and uh, looking forward to kind of, you know, the next little week here, some big important games uh, coming down the stretch and some milestones for some players and Nugent Hopkins and others. So uh, uh, looking forward to that. Um, so Phil, anything else? That's it. I think that's all you want to add. Um, that's it. Yeah. Here right. we, here we go. The, the roller coaster of being a flames fan by the time this uh, podcast comes out, they might be out and done and curtains. And I think I've said they've been curtains the last week and here we are two points out. Um, we'll see what happens. So come down to the last game of this. Season, I, th- right? I think, I think you and I have a, have a bet, Hey, a 10 piece chicken nugget meal. Yeah, I might move it up to 20 because I think the Flames are going to win. So I, well, you I've can't on, change it now, I, but I've been on them for uh, for a while here thinking they can do it because I just believe in that group. So, but we'll see. Well, since we made the bet, they've kind of come roaring on here. So yeah, yeah. I think, I think if I got to buy you a 10 piece nugget meal, but it's going to be worth it. So, yeah, exactly. All right. Well, uh, we'll chat with you guys next week. We well, appreciate everyone tuning in and taking the time to listen to us here at the two months podcast. And, uh, and um, we hope you guys enjoyed these amazing interviews with uh, these three amazing guests. Thank you.